All right. Um, thank you. And this is really hard stuff to talk about and right at the edge of what I, I have been exploring. So I'm very grateful that people have turned out to explore it with me. Um, content heaviness and metaphoric tangles and all. And um, I'll get straight into tonight's one. And I'm going to start with, oh, hang on a second. I'm not. Ah, I'm going to start with um, a reading from Isaiah 43. And the bold is for us to read together. I'm about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The wild animals will honour me. Tonight, uh, the dragon and the budgie, for I give water in the wilderness, streams in the desert to give drink to my chosen people and together, the people whom I formed for myself, so that they may declare my praise. And a quote from Howard Morphy, who was an anthropologist who spent a lot of time up north, and he writes about Biryun as the shimmering brilliance that Yolnu artists aim to create to evoke the scintillating light of nature that is the spirit of place. And I'm actually giving you this talk from Melbourne, so I'm a bit confused in place myself, but to take you to where Streams in the Desert actually meets, and this is where we were a couple of weekends ago, um, Artiura, the original Alice Springs, just north of Mabantwa, and we were sitting in a trail of purple flowers where the stream had been, the Todd River had been flowing in January, um, which was delightful. And I particularly wanted to thank the Streams in the Desert leadership, which is um, Ralph and Michaela and Alex. All the heinous theology that's problematic is mine, but a lot of this has come out of morning prayer together and all the time we spend together trying to go deep with these ideas in place. And I'm extremely grateful to them. And I'm going to start with, I'm um, going to enter the gates with thanksgiving and the courts of God with praise and take you to the hills north of uh, Mabantua and read a poem. I thank you, God, for most this amazing day, for the leaping greenly spirits of trees and the blue true dream of sky, for everything which is natural, which is infinite, which is yes. I, who have died, am alive again today, and this is the sun's birthday. This is the birthday of life and of love and of wings and of the gay, great happening, illimitably earth. How should tasting, touching, hearing, seeing, breathing, any, lifted from the know of all, nothing, human, merely being, doubt unimaginable you? Now the ears of my ears awake, and now the eyes of my eyes are opened. And that's E. Cummings. And a prayer together, and again, the bold for all of us. Um, there's a fourth century Eucharistic prayer of Serapion of Thmus that expresses the center of the experience for the early Christians and of what their faith meant for them. The prayer addresses God and together. We entreat you, make us truly alive. And um, now a reading from M.K. Turner, who um, we encountered last week. And um, you just heard this as a song, so she gave um, me permission for John and I to um, record it as a piece of music, but I'm going to read to you um, her words now. At Mariana, our language land is like a root or tie to us. It holds all of us. The only way that we can translate into English how we see our relationship with the land is with the words hold and connect. The roots of this country and its people are twined together. We are part of the land, the land is us, and we are the land. That's how we hold our land. And it's really important for our kids to know why we want our land to live on, to go back to, because we've got a strong tie to it. It's like a big twirl of string that holds us in there with our families. That's where all our culture and our names, our skin names come from. That's why we hold a big treasure of land for us. And we have a special name for that tile string. It's called Uchera. Uchera be, can be like Uchera Ala, you might say. Uchera Weka. I'm hearing a message from that line. And that Uchera means a telephone. And when he's hearing on the telephone, that person can see in his mind, he knows it, what that line runs. They can see it, where the message is coming from, like a string. And Uchera is also like a vein in yourself and in your country and how you relate. One time I was talking to this person here and I was describing it. It's like when we used to dig yam. When you dig for yam, you find a yam. It's like a bean in there. 
but also there's another string coming from it that lays further down. That's uchera. And when you follow that uchera, you find another yam. So that's how we call it uchera. It's like those lines that go straight and connect to this and connect to this and connect to this. And we're going to come back to that second part. Oh. We'll go to our psalm today, which is a psalm um, of revival. And, oh, sorry, I had a bit of trouble with the um, thing. And we'll read it together. And um, if you could read the, the bit in bold. And it's for the director of music of the Sons of Korah, a psalm or a melody. Lord, you were favourable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob together. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You pardoned all their sin. Selah. You withdrew all your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. Restore us again, O God of our salvation, and put away your indignation towards us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again so that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak for he will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and will make a path for his steps. And on the right is a stained glass window that's in the Catholic Church in Alice Springs. And our scripture reading is Isaiah 2, which is a bit grim, um, and but I'm going to come back to it in bits. But if you're a bit Bible, it might be worth having it in front of you at some point. I will just put it there. And just to give you the background, um, so... The Israelites enter the promised land, as we um, did last week. Sometime later, the people wanted a king. God said it wasn't the best idea, but gave them King Saul, who went bad, and there were harem issues there too. Um, then came David, who was the best of all the kings and who wrote many songs. And then his son Solomon, who was very wise, but amassed to himself too many women, and his heart turned at the end of his days. And the kingdom split into the northern kingdom, of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And we're going to be in the northern kingdom. Um, the northern kingdom had a long line of very bad kings. And Jeroboam was the first king after the split. He was worried that his people would go to the temple, which was in the southern kingdom, and he would lose control of them. So he made up a parallel religion which sounded like it was worshipping God, but which kept people where he wanted them. He set up golden calves in two of his own cities and he appointed people who pleased him as priests. This uh, Yahweh naming religion bent to serve the interests of power is glossed as the sins of Jeroboam and it persisted right through with a period of overt Baal worship in the middle. And so the Northern Kingdom became a place where they trampled on the heads of the poor and denied justice to the oppressed. After a couple of centuries of this, the prophet Hosea was sent to the northern kingdom who appear in this reading as the unfaithful beloved and it, it is a strong reading and I'm going to read it and ask you to stay with whatever's strongest for you and there'll be a little bit of silence at the end just to sit, let it settle a bit. Hosea 2 goes like this. Bring charges against your mother. Bring charges for she is not my wife nor am I her husband. Let her put away her harlotries from her sight and her adulteries from between her breasts, lest I strip her naked and expose her as in the day she was born, and make her like a wilderness, and slay her like a dry land, and slay her with thirst. I will not have mercy on her children, for they are the children of harlotry, for their mother has played the harlot. She who has conceived them has behaved shamefully, for she said, I will go after my lovers who gave me my bread and my water my wool and my linen, my oil and my drink. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up your way with thorns and wall her in so that she cannot find her paths. She will chase her lovers but not overtake them. Yes, she will seek them but not find them. 
Then she will say, I will go and return to my first husband, dear God. For then it was better for me than now. For she did not know that I gave her grain, new wine and oil and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. Therefore, I will return and take away my grain in its time and my new wine in its season and will take back my wool and my linen given to cover her nakedness. Now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers and no one shall deliver her from my hand. I will also cause all her mirth to cease, her feast days, her new moons, her Sabbaths, all her appointed feasts. I will destroy her vines and her fig trees of which she has said, these are my wages that my lovers have given me. So I'll make them a forest and the beasts of the field shall eat them. I will punish her for the days of the bales to which she burned incense. She decked herself with her earrings and jewellery and went after her lovers, but me she forgot, says the Lord. Therefore, I am now going to allure her. I will lead her into the wilderness and speak to her heart. There I will give her back her vineyards and will make the valley of Achor, which is the valley of trouble, a door of hope. There she will sing as in the days of her youth, as in the days she came up out of Egypt. In that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. You will no longer call me my master. I will remove the names of the Baals, which means masters, from her lips. No longer will their names be invoked. In that day, I will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, the birds in the sky and the creatures that move along the ground. Bow and sword and battle I will abolish from the land so that all may lie down in safety. I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you in righteousness and justice, in love and compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness and you will know the Lord. In that day I will respond, declares the Lord. I will respond to the skies and they will respond to the earth and the earth will respond to the grain, the new wine and the olive oil. And they will respond to Jezreel, which is a place, but it also means God sows or God will sow. And I will plant her for myself in the land. I will show my love to the one I called, not my loved one. I will say to those called, not my people, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God. And I can't give you songs because of my computer. So in my head, I've got after the silence, there is the singing. So now silence to stay with whichever part of all that was most strong for you this evening. And now silent prayers for this time or anything that's on your heart. And now together at the top. Glory be to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we could ask or imagine. Glory be to God from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. And a quote from Paul Salan, it is time that the stone grew accustomed to blooming that unrest formed a heart. And sorry, I've got to find my next fish. Oh. about that so we're going to do a little yeparinia interlude oh no i've got some questions for you that's right sorry um so first question i'm not going to read that again but that's the second half of the quote you heard from mk and my question is do you recognize anything of what she describes in your own experience
And my second question is, um, Rachel Perkins wrote a monthly article about the Arunda Women's Project where MK Turner and other elders taught the next generation the ancient songs. And she called her article Songs to Live By. Do you have songs you live by? What are they? And my third question is, um, have an attempt to map with a pen or paper or just with your finger on a surface where you think Christ is to be found in 2023. That is to say, what is your geography of holiness? After all that um, heavy Hosea, we're going to have a yipper in year interlude. Um, so Mabantua is caterpillar dreaming country and the mountain ranges are the traveling caterpillars. And here's one um, from the same hills that you were looking at before. And there are a variety of types of caterpillars, but one is yipper in year. And you hear this name around. Um, it's the main shopping center is called yipper in year, and so is one of the schools. And um, this is a painting by Wenton Rabunja, which is also in the Catholic Church, which is called um, Yiprinyi Dreaming. And I'd seen a photo of these caterpillars and I really wanted to see them, but I hadn't. And I just longed to see them. And then one day they were there. They appear on the tar vine, which is called a yepe, which is very low down to the ground. And their name actually means belonging to the yepe. So a yepe renyo, and it appears in multiple spellings, other ones that these are not the only spellings of it there. Um, one day a local person showed me one. And when they're here, once you pay attention, they're everywhere. And I spent a lot of time being very excited and photographing them and videoing them crawling along stems in the ground that first year. And it seemed so improbable to me that something so mad, beautiful and colourful had suddenly appeared. And it I started to make sense of other things that I'd seen and heard. And that's the last one. There are many more photos. Um, babies born in Alice Springs are often called Yipperinia babies and this is why and this is a quote from Dick Kimber who's a, a white fella historian but he's writing about his interactions with um, Wenton Rabuncha. A consequence of the Yipperinia Caterpillar Association with much of Alice Springs is that probably a majority of local people in Alice Springs are both conceived and born in Yipperinia country. On several occasions over the years Wenton asked after my son and daughter how are these little Yipperinia caterpillars going my good boy? went and always incorporated any child he knew had been born in the Alice Springs Hospital in this way. they got to look after this country now, he often said. Little Arunda mob, little white fella mob, whole lot, all the little yepper in you, they all the same. And now a bit of um, Hosea discussion. Um, so as God's people turned away from God, God kept pouring out ongoing life in their place. So the rains and the crops and the generations continued on. And he also sent prophet after prophet to speak life to his people. So Elijah and Elisha were prophets to the northern kingdom. And the first prophets who wrote are Hamas and Isaiah, and they were too. Amos and Hosea describe different facets of the heart of God. Amos describes God's heart for justice in the face of oppression. So it's Amos who says, God despises their religious festivals and wants righteousness and justice to run down like a mighty stream. Hosea describes God's heart of love and God is desperately in love with his people, but he has been cheated on and scorned these last 200 years as they run after other gods to try to earn the good life, the very thing he is gifting them. The life God is pouring out is being turned to corrupt purposes and so finally God is going to stop and the land will become as the soul of its people, thorny and bare. And the first part of Isaiah 2 is a vivid and awful picture of what a broken relationship with God and the land looks like. But this isn't the final word. Everything God does, the initial marriage, the dogged faithful persistence whilst being ignored, his withdrawal of his life-giving presence is all for his people. God's people find their way has been cut off, their efforts can't solve this. And so finally they have space and God 
allures his beloved. And the word allure in the Hebrew is patach, which means spaciousness. When we find ourselves in a space beyond our control, a wild space, that's where God comes. And the wild spaces are, in the end, for connection. Hosea's writing falls over itself with words of connection. The valley of trouble becomes a door of hope. Seeing husband covenant with the beasts and the birds and the creatures. Betroth, betroth, betroth. Righteousness, justice, love, compassion, faithfulness. No, respond, 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 respond. Plant in the land, show my love. Say, you are my people. Say, I am your God. It's like blazing life in all the dimensions, connecting people to God, to creation, to each other and to their true self. Or, to quote MK, it's lines that go straight and connect to this and connect to this and connect to this. The word covenant in the Hebrew means cut. There is always a cut. The lying voice says no cut is needed, nothing has to be given up and promises us the world. But this voice does not love us and in the end cuts connections in place to take the life of people for itself. God asks us to cut all that would take his place, so he asks us to choose him first. And it may feel like death, but actually it is for life connecting us in all the dimensions. Or um, Jesus' words in John, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. The lying voice says there's need not be trouble <laughs> and we can pretend there isn't. But underneath is fear, anxiety, and a sense of creeping woe. And I feel young people particularly um, are immersed in this at this time. God says there is trouble. The world is trouble, but it is not the final word. The Valley of Achor, which is the Valley of Trouble, it's the valley where Achan was stoned in Joshua 7, is the doorway to hope here. So it's the same place. Staying with the trouble is the pathway to life, just like it was at Meribah. And the word for hope in Hebrew is tikveh, it means cord. And I think of it as a golden thread that is the covenant promise that is always there, even in the midst of the crackling dark, connecting us to God and drawing us forward into life. And I'm going to give you a poem that I love as an interlude. And this is, um, this is called No Help For That. It's by Charles Pukowski. There is a place in the heart that will never be filled a space, and even during the best moments and greatest times, we will know it. We will know it more than ever. There is a place in the heart that will never be filled, and we will wait and wait in that space. I think this is the wild space, and that Mr. Mikowski is almost right in that it is by definition outside our control, and so we can't fill it, but God can. And these wild spaces are, in fact, holy spaces. And um, as Jonathan Sachs, who was the um, chief rabbi in Britain, writes, holiness is the space we make for the otherness of God. By listening, not speaking, by being, not doing, by allowing ourselves to be acted on rather than acting. It means disengaging from that flow of activity whereby we impose our human purposes on the world, thereby allowing space for the divine purpose to emerge. And in scripture, in Hebrew scripture, these holy spaces are found in the heart, in the temple, and in the world. And I think one of the genius innovations of David, who I love, um, was how he sung those three together in his songs. There are forces always seeking to fill these spaces, to plunder our lives for themselves. And so we need limits to hold these spaces so they are not profaned. But then if we wait in the space, our holy God comes and the world comes alive in a golden lattice of connections. And in my head, this next bit is called After the Silence, There is the Singing. So these connections described in Hosea are live and they run both ways. So they're between us and God. Um, so or God speaks, actually. So the word is debar, that active transforming speech to our heart. So it's God to us and then we sing to God. And in Hosea, we know God and know is like you know someone who is here not like you know a famous person that lived a long time ago and it's like you know a partner not like a boss so we call him husband and not master here and then there's connections between us and the created world so god covenants with the creatures in their place um and he says in that day i'll make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field the birds in the sky and the creatures that move along the ground and the created world responds 
And the word um, respond here is Anna. So it can be respond or sing or say, I like sing, but I think all of them are valid. Um, whatever captures best how you think it might be that the sky communicates with the earth, but I'm going to use sing. In that day I will sing, declares the Lord. I will sing to the skies and I will sing to the earth and the earth will sing to the grain, the new wine and the olive oil, and they will sing to Jezreel and I will plant her for myself in the land. And so there are lines that connect God to the skies and the skies to the earth and the earth to the harvest and the food and the drink that come from it and everything to us as God plants us in the land. And so this is my questions for you. Um, this is a, a quote from Helen Garner, which I like. Um, Eros is in the excitement that flashes through you when a teacher explains an intellectual proposition and you grasp it, or when someone tells a joke and you get it. Eros is the quick spirit that moves between people, quick as in the distinction between the quick and the dead. It's the moving force that won't be subdued by habit or law. Its function is to keep cracking open what is becoming rigid and closed off. Great stand-up comics thrill us by trying to ride its surge. It's at the basis of every heresy and remember that feminism itself is heresy against a monolith. Eros mocks our fantasy that we can nail down life and control it. It's as far beyond our attempts to regulate it as sunshine is or a cyclone. My first question is, can our relationship to God be like this? And what about our connection to the created world? And my second question is about Milkery, and, and the whole book is about what Milkery are, so I'm going to inadequately describe it as songs sung by women um, up um, in, in Arnhem Land, the all-new folk, and this is an extraordinary book, and the authors write, we cry Milkery for everything, from the smallest living creature that lives in the earth to the farthest stars that we can see, the maggots and flies for the soil and its deep roots. It's a big responsibility. We let that feeling flow through us. Let our body be that body of water of which we sing. Let our singing and crying milkery be that body and our body and know that we in country are one, that we are country, that we must do milkery, name country, harmonise with country, so that our knowledge, our sound, the vibration inside us brings country alive, makes it sacred again and again and again. Of that body of water we sing and that water sings us. And my question is, if you hold this against the end of Hosea that we've just been spending time with, how is it the same? How is it different? Um, so song lines is the one of the first books I read when I first came to Alice Springs and it's magnificent and flawed and I think captures somehow the feel of the place from a white fella point of view in any case even now and it's British author Bruce Chatwin came um, to Alice because of the work of Theodore Strelo so Theodore's father Carl um, led the Hermansburg mission at the start of last century and Theodore grew up amongst Western Aranda kids and speaking language. And many people here, I keep saying here because I wrote this when I was there, um, trusted him with their precious things and their songs. And he wrote the songs down and he was a very fine writer. So he translated them into English and wrote them as very good poetry. And this became the, people always say magisterial when they describe it, magisterial songs of Central Australia. And um, Theodore himself was also magnificent and flawed, particularly at the end of his life. But the things he kept have been of great ongoing value to the Aranda people. Darren Jorgensen, an academic, said Strelo's work was a floating dreaming. 
um, using an expression coined by Jolene Harmson. I'm just going to give you this quote. Strelo's poetic translations hold a miscommunication built into them, for in their original cultural and ceremonial context, they are quite simply not poetry or song. Yet here they are as poetry and song, de-territorialised as a floating dreaming. So their connection to um, particular time and place has been cut so they can be read um, at any time and in any place. And this seems exciting to me in one way because I am very partial to a floating dreaming. So books, talk, songs, poetry, information, uh, really important to me. And Jorgensen also cheekily claims in this article that scripture is a floating dreaming. And I think he's probably right. And scripture is the passion of my life. I think we need floating dreamings. But they need to be planted in the ground and come up in our particular time and place to be alive ongoing. Our culture at this time does not major on the coming down to the ground. If our life is about rising upwards, then this will be like Naaman being asked to bathe in a dirty river and we won't like it. The people of Hosea too didn't. It was a long, slow journey of disappointment and stripping and loss. It's risky dropping a seed into the ground. It's like dying. But to be founded in Christ, we need to be grounded in the real. And I've come to think of Christ as the way through death into life. I'm sorry, the way through death to life in the reality of what is. Instead of dwelling at the top of our pyramids, we find ourselves standing on the ground with everyone else. We're not superior, but we don't need to be. We just need to be life where we are. And, oh, sorry, that was my beautiful picture that I wasn't showing you while I was reading that. Um, and um, my question is, there's a metaphor that um, comes up all the time in First Nations theological circles, and it's part of the one top Babuya curriculum in Cairns, but I've quoted um, Di Langham here, and it's about the church as a pot plant. And um, the Reverend Di Langham writes, I always think that when people start talking about the church, they're talking about a pot plant. They brought out and put on the land and they nurture it and they prune it and make it fit on the land, but it never actually gets roots. And my question is, is this true? And what would a church that was planted in the ground look like? And my second question is, there's a First Nations theologian who spends a lot of time with people out west of Alice, and he told me he talks out there about righteousness as right connection or relationship, and particularly on these four axes. So right relationship to God, right relationship to others, right relationship to the earth or creation, and right relationship to the self. And this is adapted from a schema from the theologian Christopher Wright. How does this fit with your current working definition of righteousness? And if it were true, does it make things simpler or more complicated? another bit of me talking. <laughs> uh, someone once said to me there was a cycle that repeated in Central Australia. There'd be the latest great project in Indigenous affairs and it would come with a huge amount of enthusiasm and excitement. Money would be secured and detailed plans would be drawn up. Then the work would start. A spade would be put into the ground. It would hit the bedrock of colonialism and the whole thing would fold. And it was such a vivid metaphor. It stuck with me, obviously. And I went back like an hour later to thank the person and they said they'd never said it. So I don't know where it came from or who I'm citing, but I do think it describes a true thing. Endless ideas and projects that do not come to anything because they are not grounded in lived reality. 
And it raises the question as to why all these enthusiastic people don't know that they're building on a false foundation. I think it's because they're not close enough to the ground to see, because we believe what is real is best seen from high up and a long way away. This, of course, is the view of settler colonialism. But nothing real can be built on a false foundation, and so there's a sterility to our conversations and our activity and our solutions. We have an idea of the sort of world that comes into being when God speaks, because we live in it. <laughs> And it's sort of a magic fractal kingdom with infinite detail as you both go in and as you go down. There are limits in the created world. So the land is not the sky and a fish is not a bird, is not a rock wallaby. But within those limits is wild diversity. The English countryside does not look like remote Australia. And thank God for that. We also know what it looks like when our settler colonial pyramids speak into the real. And one thing it looks like in central Australia is buffalo grass, which is here depicted. Um, when cattle came here, their hooves destroyed the ground cover and the earth um, started to blow away in dust storms. Getting rid of cattle was and is not on the table, so instead we introduced buffalo. It holds the soil down and it's an okay last resort feed for cattle, but it's taking everything over. Where there was once a wild diversity of grasses and flowers and the life that depended on them, say your friendly caterpillars, there's now buffalo spreading as far as the eye can see. I miss the wildflowers that would have been. Um, the yepreni are also um, disappearing for other reasons. A yepe is sprayed for gravel or for lawns. And the yepreni only eat very specific plants. So when they're consumed, the caterpillars disappear as well. And there was a lovely family that uh, moved here from the edge one of the yepreni years. And they did see them, but they spent their time picking them off and killing them because where they were from, um, caterpillars were things that destroyed all the plants in your garden. White fellas don't tend to so much sing about Yeparini or the wildflowers or any of the things particular to our places. But our days are still full of songs and songs still work to connect us to what we sing about. And so we are connected to products or sporting teams or celebrities or programs screened at us. And I think we need to be very careful about our songs. Our songs still matter. And it's a quote from Bill Harney. You sing a song and then you follow your song. In that track, you go along singing the song like a blazed mark. I've just got a couple more questions. Um, this is not um, buffalo. This is um, a native plant. With flowers. Um, I've argued here that settler colonial values persist as a sense that the important things come from the top of pyramids, higher up and somewhere else. Is this true in your own worlds? Is there a buffalo grass equivalent in your world, either literally or metaphorically? And what is it taking the place of? And this is a quote from Ephesians, my third question. Um, it's Paul saying, although I'm the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to me to bring to the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ and to make everyone see what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, so that through the church the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. And the Greek word translated rich variety here is a delightful polypocalus, and it's uh, translated manifold in the King James. It means ultra diverse with multitudinous expressions or facets according to helps. And Strong's defines it as much variegated, marked with a great variety of colors of a cloth or a painting, much varied, manifold, manifesting itself in a great variety of forms. And my question is, um, if the wisdom of God is like this, what does this mean? Where do you see it? Where don't you see it and would like to? And is polypoikulus a theological value?
directly. So I think theologically Christ is in my heart and so also comes in the heart of the other and Christ is where two or three gather in his name. That is to say the church is these small groups alive on the ground and Christ speaks directly into the tangled reality of our own small gatherings. Much that is good comes from somewhere else. Scripture and the songs of the global church, say, which both matter very much to me, but they need to be planted and come up alive in our own place and time. And whilst it is the same Christ in all the times and places, there is a particularity about what he calls us into in our own time and place. And I like this quote um, um, from uh, the American theologian, Willie James Jennings, about what he thought um, theological schools should do, I think churches should also do. Forming erotic souls that are being cultivated in an act that joins to the bone that announces a contrast life aimed at communion. By communion, I mean the deepest sense of God-drenched life attuned to life together, not with people in general, but with the people that comprise the place of one's concrete living and the places, the landscapes, the animals and the built environments that constitute the actual conditions of one's life. This doesn't mean that we don't need the broader institutional church, but its job is to hold these um, live spaces for life on the ground. But once you have an institution, it's tempting to run the church like a pyramid. So God only speaks from the top and there's one voice and we all unify around that. If we are used to that, then coming back down to the ground will seem messy because there are a lot of voices and it creates more tensions at first and ongoingly, actually. And I, when I was trying to write one of my apps, um, Songs from a Strange Land, I had, I, it was bursting my head, but my the tensions I was trying to hold together, I ended up putting in a diagram and they were scripture, the evangelical and liberal Christian views, First Nations voices and theologies and the created world and the built world. And I found it extremely difficult. Um, and I'm sure there are many, many more tensions that other people are holding in their own place. I think a disconnection to place from our settler colonial origins has pervaded much of what we think it is to be church. And so putting place back in troubles all that but the door of hope opens in the valley of trouble and I think there's something about tensions that are built into what it means to follow God and I'm going to just shift to another aspect of Hosea 2 um, where I think these tensions are built in so in Hosea 2 God woos us with a list of values so I'll betroth you to me forever I'll betroth you and this is Sedek and Mishpat in Hesed and Racham I'll betroth you in Emet, and you will know, and this is this personal knowledge, the Lord. So it seems that knowing God is all of these together, but these are not the same thing at all down here. And many of our church fights hinge on precisely the differences between them. So you'll have one group shouting love and another group shouting righteousness, or one group shouting justice and another group shouting truth. And often there is no connection at all. So the two groups are just talking straight past each other. But in scripture, these values appear together. And this list, and there's a couple more, um, are repeated over and over in Hebrew scripture. So often it's like what we might now think of as a creed. We can't reduce them into the same thing, but our psalm today hinges on where they meet. And so it's surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Hesed and Emet will meet. Sedek and Shalom, which is another one, which is um, peace, so wellness, um, um, like wholeness, will kiss each other. Emet will spring up from the ground and Sedek will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. The meeting place of all these things is what it looks like when salvation comes and the glory of God dwells in our land. That is to say, Christ is the meeting place. For us, it's hard work not to prematurely opt out of the tensions between them by cutting out one or the other or absorbing one in, into the other or opting out of discernment altogether using generic rules issued higher up and somewhere else. But we need to hold all these values and the tension between them in trust that the place of trouble is also the door of hope. And it will be for us in time Christ, who is the way. And my question here is, so many of the stories of Jesus' life describe his reaction to the tension between the application of two good values to any particular situation. So 
keeping the Sabbath versus healing the sick or justice versus mercy in the case of the woman who committed adultery or hospitality versus wearing the right robe in the parable of the great banquet. In the story of Mary and Martha, Martha's work of hospitality is being held against Mary sitting at Jesus' feet and listening. And Jesus here sides with Mary, telling her that she has chosen the better part. And my questions are, why does Jesus go the way he does? How does this apply now to you when you're caught between these two values? Should you always prioritise the value Jesus does here? Why or why not? If we can't make a generic rule out of this story, what is it for? And my second question is um, a quote from John. The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus. Um, why grace and truth? Why not just one or the other? How are they the same? How are they different? And how are they different to law? Keep staying back, sorry. Um, so we need limits to hold these wild spaces. In particular, there's a limit beyond which we cannot go in knowing or controlling another, a space that is for the other before God alone, not in the name of helping them or saving them even. And so too, groupings at the ground have limits that cannot be breached. That is the holy life of individuals and groups, and it is not for the plundering. I think there is widespread plundering. Um, I think last time I argued that the corruption at our origins, uh, the origins of settler colonialism is using power to breach limits and take for the self, but with the appearance and feel of virtue, that is to say the abuse of power whilst being blind to it. This persists. And so we have this endless litany of abuses of power in our marriages, churches and institutions. Scripture, the vast bulk of which describes how to be God's people over and against oppressive power, has instead been bent to its service. One of my images of how this works is the church is a pyramid emitting a stream of words like a pale blue light to control the people on the ground. And the church becomes a franchise operating to standardise people. You could say the pale blue light is these right words as determined by power. And it is what Paul refers to as the law that brings death. We follow what Luke called the day spring from on high instead. And so we pass through death into a world lit up by the glory of God. And I love this quote from Rowan Williams. The light of the resurrection doesn't just allow us to see ourselves a bit more clearly. That alone might not be terribly cheery. The light of the resurrection allows us to see the entire landscape of God's creating work lit up by the grace of Christ and the presence of the spirit. That by God's grace is our homeland. That is where we belong. And so now to the shimmering. <laughs> And I'm going to read you a little bit from Deborah Bird Rose while showing you some pictures, hopefully. And I'm reading you from two essays she wrote, one delightfully called Shimmer When All You Love's Being Trashed, and the second's called Shimmer. And she was an anthropologist who spent a lot of time with people um, uh, north of Alice but south of Arnhem Land. And here, Deborah Bird Rose. In his classic essay titled From Dull to Brilliant, the anthropologist Howard Morphy discusses art in the Arnhem Land region of North Australia. His focus is on the Yolnu term biun, which translates as brilliant or shimmering. This is an aesthetic that is found in many parts of Australia and is not limited to art. It pervades ritual, dance, and many aspects of life more widely. As Morphy describes brilliance or shimmer, both terms are good, the process of Yolnu painting starts off with a rough blocking out of shapes and then shifts to fine grain crosshatching. When a painting has just its rough shape, the artists describe it as dull. The cross hatching shifts the painting to brilliant, and it is the brilliance of finely detailed work that captures the eye. Biyun is the shimmer, 
the brilliance, and the artists say it is a kind of motion. Brilliance actually grabs you. Brilliance allows you or brings you into the experience of being part of the vibrant and vibrating world. When a painting reaches brilliance, for example, people say that it captures the eye much in the way that the eye is captured by the sun glinting on water. There is power here. You all know people will compare the glint of brilliance with the flash of anger in a shark's eye. There are similar captures all over the place water capturing and reflecting the sun, the sun glinting on wet leaves, the eye of the beholders captured and enraptured, the shark flashing its look, the rippling intra-activity of it all. The gl this glittery shine, this shimmer, has a twofold effect for the Yolnu people. It testifies to the presence of ancestral power and it may create in the person who is captured by it the actual experience of that power. When one is captured by shimmer, one experiences not only the joy of the experiential capture, but also, and more elegantly, as one becomes more knowledgeable, one participates actively in the flow of ancestral power. Morphe was fascinated by the fact that while the full meaning of Billion is culture specific, the experience of shimmer is cross-cultural. We are all capable of being captured by shimmer, and we are all capable of knowing that something significant is happening. Now back to me, I think we know this when we see it. It is delight. It is danger too, like the glint in a shark's eye. And I think we are created to join in. In Isaiah 43, the stream in the desert is in the end for praise. And the Hebrew root to come, um, word for, used there comes from the root halal. We know it also as hallelujah or praise yah. And the last seven songs in the Psalter start and end with hallelujah. Halal means to shine, to be clear of sound, but usually of colour, to flash forth light. Scripturally, it's mostly used to describe humans praising, but it's also used of the shining of the sun in Job 31 and the stars of heaven flashing forth light in Isaiah 13 and my favourite of the Leviathan sneezing in Job 41.10. So his sneezes flash forth light and his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. What does it mean to praise like the sneezing of Leviathan? I was snorkeling above a manta ray once and it did a somersault for no reason at all. And I think it's something like that. And I want to read for you Psalm 148. This I think is not going to work. I'm going to start it in Hebrew. And if it doesn't work, um, if you go and listen to Mekron Mamre reading it in Hebrew, it's magnificent and much better than me reading it in English. Mizmor kuf memhet, hallelujah. Hallelujah et Adonai min ashamayim, hallelujah bam meromim. Praise ye him, sun and moon. Praise him, all ye stars of light. Praise him, ye heavens of heavens and ye waters that be above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He hath also established them forever and ever. He hath made a decree which shall not pass. Praise the Lord from the earth, ye dragons and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and vapours, stormy wind fulfilling his word, mountains and all hills, fruitful trees and all cedars, beasts and all cattle, creeping things and flying fowl, kings of the earth and all people, princes and all judges of the earth, both young men and maidens, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is excellent. His glory is above the earth and heaven. He also exalteth the horn of his people, the praise of all his saints, even of the children of Israel, a people near unto him. Praise ye the Lord. Oh, Me? no. Question. Oh, sorry. I have problem tonight with this. My question is, have you ever been captured by Shema? And what do you make of the link that I've drawn to praise? So praise connects us to God and to each other and as we sing the things of place to what we hold in common and plunder and privatise as we may, place is irreducibly common. In Psalm 148, praise is also the raising up of our horn, that is to say, standing in the full height and power of who we are. 
God's power is not oppressive power that steals our life away. This is the sort of power that brings water from a rock, or what Dylan Thomas wrote about as the force that through the green fuse drives the flower. Our world is much trouble, but we don't need to be in despair. The power of the new is greater than all the forces of the dark, and new things continue to spring up from the ground. The praise of infants silences the foe and the avenger, it says in Psalm 8. And when the tod runs, the living edge is the gentlest rivulet. I saw it diverted by an empty can of Coke once. It seems improbably weak, but behind it, the whole river is coming. And this quote from Buckler Bahabal keeps coming up in our streams gatherings. Life cannot be destroyed for good, but then, then neither can history be brought entirely to a halt. A secret streamlet trickles on beneath the heavy cover of inertia and pseudo events, slowly and incons inconspicuously undercutting it. It may be a long process, but one day it must happen. The lid will no longer hold and will start to crack. Mark Fisher in Capitalist Realism says, we live in a world that's lost its belief in real newness, so our solutions are tinkering around the edges of the same old, same old. But Christ is genuinely new. If instead of meeting with all the answers already determined from elsewhere, we meet amidst the web of live connections in place, then Christ will come and lead us forward. And I found I'm reading scripture and landscape, holding it against what's happened in that place with people who spend like quite a long time with it and then share truthfully what it's saying to them has been astonishingly alive. Righteousness is also the right path. It is Christ as the way, you might say. And in our psalm, righteousness will go before him and will make a path for his steps. And it is particular. A third meaning of halal endearingly is foolish, and it may well also be that. We can try to hold it against the entire system of ideas, as I do, and much that is interesting comes from that. But you still have only one way forward, and it likely won't solve all that. Instead, it will be a spring bubbling up into a stream for life in our place. And this talk has really been about um, what I think of as a geography of holiness. We need wild spaces in all the places, in our hearts, in the heart of the other, where two or three gather and in our world, and including and especially in our cities. Many more people are formed by the actual wild places there, the Yarra River say, and they matter terribly ongoingly. And we need to respect the limits that hold these spaces. Settler colonialism is so dominant, it often underestimates just how far others have already come across to meet us. And these First Nations leaders I've been citing and many more are already finding a way forward that spans both traditional culture, modern Western life and Christianity. And it's an extraordinarily innovative and creative thing. Um, donkeys were introduced and there are donkey dreamings in Alice Springs now. And this quote from Tyson Yucca Porter, I loved about this. And he says, he's quoting old man Juma, everything dreaming, he asserts annoyed, everything, even dumplings and luggage and bustle, still pattern, still sign, still a something, whirlwind and willy wagtail and www.all one. Our old people whispering through the aircon, venting plenty big story if you can listen. Ceremony.com, flash mobs, dancing. So people have come across a long way to us, but I don't think we've done the same. And I think we need to pull back our power or we will just continue the pattern of breaching limits to absorb the other into the self. If we can stay back and allow for real differences and stay in the tensions produced by them, I think we will find ourselves with a way forward opening into real life. And I wanted to end um, with a glimpse of what I think it might look like what a church planted in place might look like. I'm using the Year Killer Church panels. So the Year Killer mission is in Arnhem Land. It was established in um, 1935 on the site, the site of a Yolnu ceremony ground. And this is a photo of the Methodist Church in 1963. In 1962, the people were fighting the annex annexation of their land for large scale bauxite mining. And a group of leaders um, supported by Edgar and Ann Wells, the Methodist missionaries at the time, painted these Yerkula church panels. And you can see them on the left and the right of the altar there. And then this is another picture of them and the name of some of the artists. There's more artists than this. And these were painted to show that the Yolnu had their own sacred heritage and to emphasize its connection to land and land ownership. 
visitors to the church would be able to see the ways in which the paintings map their rights in land and also apprehend the sense in which land was a sacred endowment. It was a brand new thing to make, to create art in this way, to make a public statement. And much has flowed from this, including the um, Yakala Bark petitions, the Barunga statement, and I would say the Uluru statement from the heart. Here's a close up of um, one of the panels, and it's describing a story about crossing the sea and a rock surface is being smited with a digging stick which is opening up into a whirlpool of fresh water. Here is Baru the crocodile, which I just liked. And there is also this. And this is from a book that Anne Wells wrote about the panel. So it's her interpretation of what the people told her. Um, and she's called it Creatures Greeting Sunrise. The top square of Midnari section is almost a pictured hymn of praise to the morning sun. The birds and animals represented here by Judah, the big goanna, and Buada, the plains turkey, are all standing with faces turned either toward the rising sun or to the places where her light is dispersing the dark shadows of night with questing, illuminating rays. The lines radiating from the sun are the rays of her light spreading out over a newly wakened world. The shorter lines are trees catching the first sunlight and marking long, thin shadows across the earth. The short lines that appear to be moving around parallel to the sunrise are thin cloud shadows moving before the early morning breeze across the open plains. The fine lines drawn across the face of the sun are the tiny ephemeral cirrus clouds that sometimes lie close to the horizon and for a brief moment draw a gossamer veil over the glory of the rising sun. And the people dance, greeting the rising sun with gladness. The Methodist church itself was split about whether mining was a good idea or not. Um, Edgar and Anne Wells were subsequently removed, I think because of something to do with the Yucala Bark petitions. The next minister removed the panels from display and all the sources I can find say they were left to rot, but I'm a bit unsure about this bit of the story. In any case, they were later rescued some years later and they're now here um, at the Bukulange Malka Art Centre. I have a sadness that they are not in a church. I worry our songs are at risk of singing, our churches are at risk of singing songs of individualism that just can disconnect us from place and each other, and in the end, steal our lives for powers that do not love us. I think we need a wild God to break what C.S. Lewis called the enchantment of worldliness, and God himself comes as a dragon in Psalm 18. I think for our churches, reconnecting with place and the people of place will be a struggle. Our own sin will be revealed. Much discernment will be needed and we may fall silent for a while. But when we emerge from it, our speech will be living water in our own place and time. And in conclusion, I mean, my view, Christianity is not exactly the same thing as the settler colonial dream or the Australian dream. And so I'm going to end with a quote, which is a challenge to this from William James Jennings. Willie James, oh, sorry, that's just my, um, just really like this rock, um, my quote. Um, he blessed it and broke open his dream, one part in each hand. To those on his left and those on his right, he said the same thing as he handed them his dream. Eat this dream and it will kill the dream that kills. Hands trembling, they wondered which of their dreams would die and which would grow stronger. And there's going to be a song now, and um, but the group question is this, um, which is, I'll put in the chat, but it's just which image was strongest for you in this talk. Thanks so much. <laughs>